On April 29, 1990, in Rushville, Indiana, six-year-old Doug Salee and his 10-year-old brother Richard learned just how dangerous even the most familiar places can be. Julie Salee and her daughter Becky were leaving their house to go visit relatives. The boys wanted to go fishing. And I said, stay together and stay on the flat ground where you're supposed to be. They said, okay, Mom. And then as I started to pull away, Douglas yelled for me, and he said, I love you. And that was the last thing he said. The pond was only a few blocks away from their house. Well, they go down the pond quite a bit. Douglas doesn't know how to swim. Richard does. Richard had been to the pond many times before. We started fishing on the flatland, and the fish went biting over us. So we went down on the cement slide. Doug was, he uses a worm, he'd get real close by the water. on yelling to him, tried to get my hand, tried to get my hand. I didn't jump in because if I would have jumped in, then no one would have got help. So I just ran to go get my mom. I knew he was going to drown. Richard come running in and said, Doug fell in the water and I can't get him out. And I yelled for Becky to go next door and tell the firemen we need their help. And then I got on the phone to the police. The call came in at 6.39 p.m. Police headquarters. Hurry up and get down to 2nd Street Pond. My son just fell in and my bro uh, bro uh, bro can't get him out. Where at, ma'am? Down 2nd Street Pond down by the barn. Sorry, please. Okay. Well, well, I'm going now. What's your name, ma'am? Julie Sweet. Okay. Bye. 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 Next door to the Salee house at the policeman's lodge, off-duty officers Dan Sheehan and Bill Surveys were playing pool. Somebody was pounding at the door. It was Becky Salee. She was crying and very panicked. Asked us to help. Dan, we got a kid in the pond east of town. Call the station. I'll get the truck, Bill. There was a young boy, Richard Salee, got in the pickup truck with me outside. Seconds seemed like minutes or hours to me, and I yelled several times for Bill. Bill, come on. Yeah, Bill, come on. Come on. <laughs> My emotions were really up because I didn't really know what we had. Not knowing whether or not we would see the boy or whether we'd be underwater, I just had a lot of anxiety going for me. Rescue workers were dispatched. Off-duty paramedic John Todd, who lived not far from the pond, also decided to go. I heard the dispatch come out from the police department of a child in, in the lake. And for some reason, I just felt like it sounded like it was really going to amount to something serious. Approximately 10 minutes after Doug fell into the pond, the first help arrived. Right as Danny pulled the truck up, I stood up in the back and looked, and there was nothing there. So I put my foot up on the edge of the truck to jump out. And as I did, I could see the young Doug Salee float to the surface. And for all intents and purposes, he appeared to be dead. As I was reaching out to grab Doug by the sweater, the biggest thing that stood out in my mind was there was no bubbles, no bubbles at all which tells you he's not breathing or trying to breathe. Yeah, I just couldn't imagine, you know, life without one of my children. And I saw him pull him out. And he was just so, he didn't have any life, did he? And I asked Danny if he was alive. And he said, we're going to work on him. Oh, and I saw his little face. It was real gray. 
and his little lips were blue. And I just knew he was dead. Within four minutes of the call for help, paramedic Todd got to the scene. When I first saw him, he was completely cyanotic in color, which means that he had not had been breathing for quite a long period of time. There was no pulse, there was no breathing, absolutely nothing whatsoever. I really felt like it was a, a lost cause at that time. Okay, clean him out. The officers had already worked to remove the water from the boy's lungs. Todd cleared his airway and began CPR. When I saw him, I knew he was dead. I knew all I could do was ask God not to take him. And that's all I was doing was just begging God, please don't take my son. And then I sat in a police car and I never felt so alone in my life. I saw my mom in the police car and everything, you know, and I asked if he was alive. Well, I finally went up there and got a glance at him. And I thought he wasn't gonna make it. And I was so, I was praying to God that through. Within two minutes or three minutes at the most, I, I first noticed his hand started to tighten up. His fingers started to flex. I was very, very surprised to actually see the child respond to the efforts. So we stopped. I watched to make sure that I was actually seeing what I thought it was and he did move his hand. So I told Danny, I said, he's starting to come around. He's starting to move. And he reached down at that time and felt for a pulse. He says, I do feel a pulse. He responded more and more and more. And it was such a good feeling, but I still knew that we, we had a very, very touchy situation. They were working on him. They'd already put a tube in him, and they'd already used some portable suction on him. And it was about that point that I heard Doug gagging and coughing, screaming, that kind of thing. And that sounded great. It sounded great. Someone yelled, do you hear that, Julie? And he was screaming. So then I finally, I wouldn't accept, you know, that he was alive until somebody actually told me and I could see for myself. When they were loading him up and putting him in the ambulance, which was only a, a minute or two after they got there, I felt like, you know, hey, we have saved somebody's life. And it was just starting to hit me. And Bill and I both jumped up and gave each other a high five in the middle of the road and thought, you know, this is a great job. You know, we've done it. We've done it. Doug Salee had been underwater for as much as 10 minutes. There was no way of knowing how much damage had been done. In any situation in which you revive a individual who has a complete cardiopulmonary arrest, the concern is always brain damage because they've been for a period of time without oxygen to their brain. Doug was taken to Rush Memorial Hospital for Dr. David Duncan, his medical director. He did experience cardiac arrest, and to recover in such a rapid time, that's most remarkable. But he was provided with properly applied CPR by three caring individuals. It's just remarkable to see someone come back from total death to being total normal. In 24 hours, it just does not happen. I've never seen it happen before. The man upstairs had to be helping him because he was, he got an opportunity most people in that position never get. He gets a second chance. Six weeks later, Doug had completely recovered when he joined the community of Rushville in honoring his rescuers. I think Bill and Dan were my best heroes and best pals best pals I have ever had. Since the incident, Doug's rescuers have become close with his family. They did everything like clockwork. They never gave up. They just kept working on him. And, you know, you just want to tell them every day, 
give him a big hug and thanks, guys. I learned next time I go near the water, I have a life jacket and a grown-up. Because if you forget your life jacket and you fall in, then you're drowned. And, well, it ain't very fun. I do that. Often the first step in saving a life is knowing who to call. If your community does not have 911, learn the emergency numbers in your area and post them by each phone. This series is dedicated to the real heroes who risk their lives to save the life of a stranger. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next week for more true stories on Rescue 911.